during the opening hymn, it's like a bus pulls up a number of folks in bed. So we'll hope and pray they get here this morning. It's great to see you. You made it here on time. Okay, so give the person next to you a pat on the back and say we made it. We're glad to have you here. This is the sixth Sunday after Easter, or after Epiphany, excuse me, after Epiphany. We have one more Sunday, the seventh Sunday, and then the following Sunday is going to be Transfiguration, where we are going to transition from the Epiphany season into the Lenten season. Lent falls a little bit later this year. Oftentimes, Ash Wednesday falls during the last part of February, and it occurs on March 2nd this year, which means Easter then falls later as well. But in anticipation for that, we have available in the back Lenten devotional booklets for you. And it's entitled Suffering Servant 
based off of Isaiah chapter 53 in the Old Testament. One of my favorite chapters, beautiful, beautiful chapter. And they are available in the back on the table. I think there's some on the Welcome Center as well. There are regular print English versions. There are large print English versions for you. And there's also Spanish versions. So maybe you know someone who speaks Spanish, they're fluent in it, maybe that's what they prefer rather than the English. You're welcome to take copies for them as well. We encourage you to take as many copies as you like. If you have a coworker, a neighbor, a family member, a friend that you think would benefit from it, by all means, grab that one and take it. We have a number of copies here right now. As those dwindle down, we'll print off more. Each week we'll keep printing until everybody's satisfied and they have enough copies that way as well. So I encourage you to, to uh, grab one on the way out here this morning. They're hot off the press. And that means Lent is just around the corner. So we'll be advertising the special series that we're gonna be doing. We are gonna have midweek Lenten services as well. But here today, we're going to hear Jesus talking about blessed is the man. And that's the title of my message, blessed is the man. And I'm going to use the psalm that is appointed for this day, and that's Psalm 1. It's a beautiful psalm, great psalm. And I'm going to be preaching off of that here this morning, blessed is the man. We have a wonderful service planned. I hope you're ready and able to sing out here this morning to take part. I want to welcome everyone who's Zooming in here this morning as well. And I just have to ask this because we got to clear the air and get it out. How many of you are rooting for the LA Rams? Show of hands. Okay, there's a few brave souls here. How many of you are rooting for the Cincinnati Bengals? Go Packers. <laughs> Brian, I don't think Packers are part of the equation. <laughs> I saw a few hands go up regarding the Bengals. Wow, okay. How many of you, again, could care less? And you're just watching it because of the food in the commercials. They're the lost soul I haven't picked one yet. I don't know who I'm going to be rooting for. I still have until about, what, 4 o'clock, 4.30 to do so. Anyway, unless some of you coming out can convince me why I should root for the Rams versus the Bengals or vice versa. Anyway, let's get into our worship. God bless you in the time that we share here together. May you draw closer to your Lord and your Savior in your faith. Our opening sentences, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Blessed are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. We sing our opening hymn, O Christ, our hope our heart's desire.
the forgiveness of our sins. Brothers and sisters, as we gather to hear the words and teachings of our Lord today, let us prepare by confessing our need to hear him. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we confess the sins of our minds, our speech, our actions, and even our inactions. We beg your mercy and forgiveness. We ask for your grace to fill us with faith in your Son, our Lord, to lead and guide us through all our days, that we rejoice in the new eternal life he has won for us by his cross and resurrection. Amen. God has heard your prayer. His love for you is boundless. In his mercy, God has given his son to die for you and to give you the forgiveness of all your sins. Upon this, your confession is a call to remain servant to Christ and by his authority. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of praise.
The Old Testament reading comes to us from Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is anyone who trusts in mankind, who seeks his strength from human flesh, and who turns his heart away from the Lord. He will be like a juniper bush in the wasteland. He will not see good things when they come. He lives in a dry place in the wilderness, in a salty land where no one lives. But blessed is anyone who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. He will be like a tree planted by water. He sends out its roots to the stream. It does not fear the heat when it comes. Its leaves will remain green. It is not concerned about a time of drought. It does not stop producing fruit. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Brothers, I am going to call your attention to the gospel that I preach to you. You received it, and you took your stand on it. You are also being saved by that gospel that was expressed in the words I preached to you, if you keep your hold on it, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died from our, for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to over 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, the stillborn child, so to speak. For I am the least of the apostles, and I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted God's church. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not ineffective. On the contrary, he worked more than all of them, and yet it wasn't my doing, but it was the grace of God, which was with me, that did it. So whether it is I or they, that is what we preach. And that is what you believe. Now, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is pointless, and your faith is pointless too. <laughs> then we're even guilty of giving false testimony about God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it were true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then it also follows that those who fell asleep in Christ perished. If our hope in Christ applies only to this life, we are the most pitiful people of all. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Ryden, for reading our first two readings there. In particular, in the second one, St. Paul, of course, is asking rhetorical questions, causing them to think through carefully that which they believed at that time that Christ, that they would not rise from the dead. And so he's pointing out the futile thinking. Indeed, he says, Christ is raised from the dead. Dear friends, I invite you to stand in honor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the gospel of the believers. Chapter. 
he, that is Jesus, went down with them and stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a large number of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, as well as from the coastal area of Tyre and Sidon. These people came to listen to him and to be healed of their diseases. Those who were troubled by unclean spirits were also cured. The whole crowd kept trying to touch him because power was going out from him and healing them all. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, because you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you whenever people hate you, and whenever they exclude and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Because of this, your reward is great in heaven. The fact is their fathers constantly did the same thing to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, because you are receiving your comfort now. Woe to you who are well fed now, because you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, because you will be mourning and weeping. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, because that is how their fathers constantly treated the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Dear friends, let us now join our hearts as we combine them together in unison and confess the words of Scripture from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. <coughs>
God our Father and our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is the Word of God incarnate in His name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, the title of the message this morning is Blessed is the Man. It's from Psalm 1. And this morning we're going to look at this psalm that is appointed for this day, Psalm 1. And we'll do so under the theme, Blessed is the Man. So let me begin here by reading it to you from what's called the EHV, in other words, the Evangelical Heritage Version. It's a fairly new translation of the Bible by Lutheran scholars. We've actually been using it during the services. That's our readings come from there. And it's actually a very wonderful translation. Psalm 1 is only six verses long. So you can follow along on the screen now as I read it. Okay. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, who does not stand on the path with sinners, and who does not sit in a meeting with mockers. But his delight is in the teaching of the Lord, and on his teaching he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted beside streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaves do not wither. Everything he does prospers. Not so the wicked. No, they are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Yes, the Lord approves of the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Dear friends, Psalm 1 serves as an introduction to the entire book of Psalms. And it's very it's a very fitting introduction. Notice how it begins. How blessed is the man? The Hebrew word that is used here can be read as an exclamation. In other words, it can be read like this: Oh, the blessedness of such a man! Exclamation point. Or how blessed by God is this person? Exclamation point. Statements like this that begin with the word blessed are called Beatitudes. Beatitudes was a common type of saying in the ancient world. And Jesus used Beatitudes both in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And he also used it here in our text today or in our gospel reading today, Luke 6, which is called the Sermon on the Plain. One day, a Sunday school teacher asked his third grade class this question. He said, where can I find the Beatitudes? One little boy quickly raised his hand and he responded, have you tried Googling it or looking for it in the yellow pages? The Beatitudes here in Psalm 1, before it goes into what the blessed man does, first says what he does not do. Notice that. Let me read it again. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, who does not stand on the path with sinners, and who does not sit in a meeting with mockers. Now, dear friends, notice those three little verbs there, walk, stand, and sit. The blessed man does not walk, what? In the advice of the wicked. That is, he does not shape his conduct after the principles of godless people. He doesn't follow, in other words, he doesn't follow the wisdom of this world. Next, the blessed man doesn't stand, notice, on the path with sinners. He doesn't establish himself in their shameful practices. By the way, whenever you see sinners or wicked, it's referring to unbelievers. And third of all, the blessed man doesn't sit 
in a meeting with mockers. That is, he doesn't sit with those who scorn and scoff at his religion. He doesn't join in with those who turn around and mock God. Verse 1 then, with its reference to the way of the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers, forms a sharp contrast with what follows here in verse 2. But his delight is in the teaching of the Lord. Some translations have the law of the Lord. And on his teaching, he meditates day and night. Some translations, again, put it, his delight is in the law of the Lord. That word can be used there as well. You see, it is in God's law that the blessed man occupies himself. Not the Reader's Digest, not anything else. Not in the world's foolishness and rebellion. Now about that word law, let me say something about that if I may, or teaching as it's translated here in the EHV. As Lutherans, when we hear that word law, our tendency is to think of law in the narrow sense. That is, we think of law as a demand or as a condemning word of judgment. Or we think of law as opposed to gospel. But here in this context of Psalm 1, the term law has a much broader sense. It refers to the whole will of God, including his primary will in our lives, which is to save us. By the way, that's gospel. So when we see the word law here, we really need to understand both law and gospel, okay? The word translated as law here is the important Hebrew word Torah, Torah. It literally means instruction or teaching, or teaching. Another way to understand Torah then is the Word of God. Now please understand the Bible is not what I call an ABM. You know what an ABM is? An automatic blessing machine. What the psalmist is trying to say here is this, if we will take the time to read God's Word and study it, the Bible will become the meat that feeds us and not the dust that chokes us. So the blessed man here delights to be in God's word. He loves to be fed by God. And notice, his delight is in the teaching of the Lord. The Torah isn't some anonymous book it's not some impersonal law code. No, this is the Torah of the Lord. Now, in most English Old Testaments, the word Lord there is in small capital letters. And dear friends, as you're reading in your Bible, most of the Bibles have it. If you're reading in your Bible in the Old Testament, you come across that word Lord, and it's in small caps, it is a sign that the Hebrew word that's used there is the, the divine name of God, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh is the name by which the one true God revealed himself to Moses, the burning bush. Yahweh is the God who made his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is the God who remembers his promises and who acts in history in order to save his people. So here where it says the teaching of the Lord, you can literally translate it as the Torah of Yahweh. It's speaking of the God whose plans and promises have been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son of God, the Word made flesh has made God known to us. Christ has brought us into that new covenant sealed with his blood shed on the cross for our sins. 
Christ Jesus lived and died and rose again in order to save us, in order to make us God's people for all of eternity. Jesus himself is the Torah of Yahweh in the flesh. He is the word of God incarnate. And this phrase, the Torah of Yahweh, moves us beyond dealing in abstract concepts or grasping for some generic God, right? Some kind of generic God who's up there or out there. Rather, the Torah of Yahweh speaks of the personal will of our personal God. The one who acted for us specifically and concretely and lovingly in the cross of Christ. This personal connection whereby we know the God who seeks us and saves us and speaks to us in his word, that's why we delight in the law of the Lord. Now let's admit it. There are times, right? There are times when we don't delight in God's word. Too often we hear without heeding. We read without responding. We confess without changing. We profess without practicing. We worship without witnessing. And we seek without sharing. We get bored or busy or tell ourselves that we don't need the Word of God that much. But dear friends, that's our old sinful self talking. You know, that old Adam, we call him, rearing his ugly head. That sucker is a dead man, though, and he needs to keep on being put to death on a daily basis, as Luther would say. If we listen to our old sinful flesh, which is really the same as listening to the devil's lies or listening to the wisdom of this world, then our lives will not be very fruitful. We will dry up spiritually without God's word. That's why Jesus says he is the vine, we are the branches. We must remain connected to him. But God has dreams of living water for us. And we are made to soak them up. Why? Because we are baptized children of God. We are new people in Christ. We've been born of water and the Spirit. And we are now indwelt by the Spirit of God. The new man in Christ resonates to the Word of God. He loves it. He delights in it. He craves it. That's who you are, dear Christian. The new man in you loves the word of God. And in the word, you find your life, both now and for eternity. In the word, you find your Savior, who loves you more than you can ever imagine. You see, in Christ, you have redemption. You have the forgiveness of your sins. In Christ, you have life abundantly and eternally sharing in his own resurrection. That is truly what it means to be blessed. That you, that's why you delight in God's word. His delight is in the teaching of the Lord. And his teaching, he meditates day and night. The blessed man is the one who keeps on pondering the scriptures, day and night, night and day, constantly, all the time. Now I'm reminded of what Moses told Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Moses said, these words that I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. Now notice what he says next. Teach them diligently to your children. And speak about them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, let the word penetrate your heart, penetrate your children's heart daily. Remember what the Lord told Joshua, chapter one, verse eight. 
He said, this book of the law, he's referring to the Torah, the Old Testament, must never depart from your mouth. And you are to meditate on it, sound familiar, day and night, so that you will act faithfully according to everything written in it, because then you will prosper in everything you do. And notice, you will what? Succeed. You will succeed. Now that brings us back to the blessed man of Psalm 1. Brings us back to verse 3. He is like a tree planted beside streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and its leaves do not wither. Everything he does prospers. Now we see why this man who meditates on God's word is called blessed. He's got a lot going for him. He's compared to a tree planted by streams of water. For a tree to be planted near abundant supplies of water is very beneficial. Just as streams supply the tree with nourishing and refreshing moisture, dear friends, think of it this way. So also God's word supplies you and I with nourishment and refreshment for our spiritual lives. When supplied with steady streams of the word of life, our lives will produce both growing faith and good works. And dear friends, please keep in mind, your faith is never static. Your faith is either growing or it's declining. And the thing that makes all the difference in the world is what are you doing with the Word of God? Today, I want to commend you to you the Word of God. I want to commend to you the study of it and the reading of it and the receiving of it and the living your lives from it. The Word of God preached and sacramented here and taught here at the church. The Word of God read and meditated on in your homes on a daily basis. Read it daily, diligently, devotedly. In fact, the more that you read it, the more that you will understand it, and the more that you will enjoy it. If your Christian life is dried up, then this is the way to be refreshed and get growing once again. This is the way for you to be, quote, like a tree planted by streams of water. Keep in mind, dear friends, the water-fed life flourishes. Now contrast that here with what we see in verses 4 and 5. Psalmist writes, not so the wicked, exclamation point. No, he says, they are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, meaning judgment day, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You see, dear friends, the wicked, the unbelievers, have no use for the word of God. They could care less about it. Without root below and without fruit above, they are discarded and they are worthless. They are cut off from the source of life itself. And so they're dead without even knowing it. The contrast running throughout this psalm is, I think, summed up really well here in verse 6, where the psalmist writes, Yes, the Lord approves the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There are two ways in life. There is the way of the righteous, and there's the way of the wicked. Two paths running in opposite directions. One way delights in and meditates on the Word of God. The other way has no use for it. They don't even bother to crack open their Bibles. One way is blessed by God. The Lord approves of the way of the righteous. In other words, the Lord knows His own. He watches over them and He cares for them. The other way, that is the way of the world, is a road that leads to destruction. 
Notice what the psalmist says. The way of the wicked will perish. And how? Eternally. You don't want to go down that road, dear friends. God's word warns you against the wrong path and he gets you going in the right direction, the path of life. On your own, you're going to stumble and you're going to fall from time to time. But Jesus will take you with him all the way home to heaven to be with him forever. His word, the word of life, is the only thing that will sustain you in this life and for the life to come. The teaching of the Lord, the Torah of Yahweh, the living dynamic word of the true and the living God, there is no other way to be blessed. Think of it this way, dear friends, and if you got a pen and a service folder handy, I encourage you to write it down. When the child of God looks into the Word of God and sees the Son of God, they are changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. Let that sink in. Let that penetrate your ears and your hearts. That's why we hold God's Word so sacred. That's why we gladly gather together on Sunday mornings and whenever the scriptures are being taught to hear it, to learn it in preaching, in Bible class, in daily devotions. Delight in and meditate on this word of God day and night, night and day. And you will be well supplied by God's life-giving word. And you will bear the fruits of faith Indeed, you will be just like a tree that is planted beside streams of water. Dear friends, we live in El Paso. It gets hot and dry. And don't go by the, the Rio Grande, right? The thing is oftentimes dried up. But think of the streams of water, the beautiful trees that you see right next to it. And Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate's life-giving and life-sustaining name, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us your Word. Through the Old Testament written by the prophets and given to us also in the New Testament through the apostles and the evangelists. Thank you, Lord, for putting that Word down in written form so that we can read it daily throughout the day, meditate upon it, to study it, that it might nourish our souls, sustain us, and keep us in the one true faith until that day when you call us home. Not only did you send the word in written form, but even more importantly, you sent the word incarnate through your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came into this world lived and died in our place that we might have that wonderful gift of salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for what Jesus did for us. Out of love for him, we crave your word. May we meditate upon it day and night for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. We pray this. Amen. Dear friends, let us sing the last two stanzas a song to thankfulness praise.
tithes and offerings as an expression of our faith, our love for our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, the Word incarnate.
Martha and Richard Neal, for Juan Chacon, for Jay Byler, for Nate Byler, for Jerry Rust, for Steve Prince, for John Weiske, for Tony and Olga Sullivan, and Lord, all those that we carry within our hearts, and those troubled by the demons of despair, loneliness, guilt, and shame, God of light. Heavenly Father, as we continue to live amid this world pandemic, we ask that you would be with all those who have tested positive for COVID, who are still experiencing various symptoms. Protect them and grant them recovery in harmony with your will. Be with them and their families. Give them your peace during this time and keep them healthy. Spare lives and draw people closer to you in faith during this pandemic. We pray for medical personnel and first responders, doctors and nurses. Keep them all healthy. Lord, we pray for this challenging time in the world. May your word continue to be proclaimed and that the Holy Spirit would be at work through it to bring people to faith in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day on behalf of two families that mourn the loss of their loved ones. We pray for the family of Steve Cox. We ask you, Lord, to be with Vicki and the family and to bring them comfort and hope. A reminder that Jesus has indeed, through his suffering, death, and resurrection, won for us a free entrance into heaven where we will be united with all the saints who go before us. And Lord, we also pray for the family of Ethel Simpson. We ask you, Lord, to be with her family as they recently, as of last night, are now mourning the loss of their loved one. Lord, Ethel was a dear sister in Christ. We ask you to be with Mary Lou and Gilbert, with all her family and friends, to comfort them, to bring them to the understanding that because of Jesus, Ethel was alive, and she is home in heaven with Jesus, just as he promised. And Lord, her cancer took her very quickly. And in many respects, Lord, that was a wonderful blessing. We thank you for all that you did for Ethel. We continue, we pray for her family at this time. Lord, we thank you for all of the many blessings you have given to us. Bless the Lord through the revelation of your Son, Jesus Christ. We stand before you without fear, and we lift up to you all in need. And Lord, we especially ask your blessings upon those who are celebrating birthdays this week, Layla Schmidt and also Jan Ryberg. Be with them, Lord. Remind them always of the sacred gift of life that is theirs. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, who hears and answers our prayers according to your steadfast love. Remember us in your kingdom, Lord, and teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, I invite you to stand as we now close out our service this morning. Again, just a reminder, don't forget to grab your Lenten devotional booklets out in the narthex of the foyer uh, for you. I also want to alert you, there will be coffee and some little muffins and donut holes. There's a limited number out there for anyone who would like some to stay and have some fellowship time together. I must say it's first come, first serve, because I'm not too sure we get enough for everyone. So, as you rush to the back, please don't trample anyone for those muffins. God bless you. Have a great day, regardless of who wins the Super Bowl. And have a wonderful day tomorrow on Valentine's Day.
as you give thanks to God for your loved ones, but especially as you give thanks for the greatest lover of our souls, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is love incarnate. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.